Section number 20 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3. A Message. The days passed quickly, whether measured by the Martian chronometer aboard the Nomad or by Carr's watch, which he was regulating to match the slightly longer day of the Red Planet. He was becoming proficient in the operation of all mechanisms of the ship, and had developed a fondness for its every appointment. Behind them the sun was losing much of its blinding magnificence as it receded into the ebon background of the firmament. The earth was but one of the countless worlds visible through the stern ports, distinguishable by its slightly greenish tinge. They had reached the vicinity of the phenomenon of space Mado had previously discovered. Carr found himself seething with excitement as the nomad was brought to a drifting speed. Mado, who had disclaimed all knowledge of navigation, was busy in the turret with a sextant. He made rapid calculations based on its indications and hurried to the controls. Find it? Carr asked. Yep. Be there in a half hour. The nose of the vessel swung around and Mado adjusted the gravity energy carefully. Carr glued his eye to the telescope. See anything? inquired Mado. About a million stars, that's all. Funny. Should be close by. Then, yes, yes, I see it, Carr exulted. A milky cloud, transparent almost. To the right a little more. The mysterious cloud rushed to meet them, and soon was visible to the naked eye through the forward port. Their speed increased alarmingly, and Mado cut off the energy. What's that? Mado stared white-faced at his friend. A voice. You hear it, too? Yes. Listen. Amazed, they gazed at each other. It was a voice, yet not a sound came to their ears. The voice was in their own consciousness, a mental image, yet each heard and understood. There were no words, but clear mental images. Beware, it seemed to warn. Come not closer, travelers from afar. There is danger in the milky fleece before you. Mado pulled frantically at the energy reverse control. The force was now fully repelling. Still, the billowing whiteness drew nearer. It boiled and bubbled with the ferocity of one of the hot lava cauldrons of mercury. Changing shape rapidly, it threw out long streamers that writhed and twisted like the arms of an octopus, reaching, searching for victims. God, whispered Carr, what is it? Take warning continued the voice that was not a voice. A great ship, a royal ship from a world unknown to you, now is caught in the grip of this mighty monster. We cannot escape, and death draws quickly near. But we can warn others and ask that our fate be reported to our home body. A sudden upheaval of the monstrous mass spewed forth an object that bounced a moment on the rippling surface, and then was lost to view. A sphere glinting golden against the white of its awful captor. "'The spaceship!' gasped Mado. "'It's vanished again!' They hurtled madly in the direction of this monster of the heavens, their reverse energy useless. "'We're lost, Mado.' Carr was calm now. This was excitement, with a vengeance. He'd wished for it, and here it was, but he'd much rather have had a chance to fight for his life. Fine ending to his dreams." Imps of the canals! The thing's alive! Mado hurled himself at the controls as a huge blob of the horrible whiteness broke loose from the main body and wobbled uncertainly toward them. A long feeler reached forth and grasped the errant portion, returning it with a vicious jerk. Turn back! Turn back! came the eerie warning from the golden sphere. All is over for us. Our hull is crushed. The air is pouring from our last compartment. Already we find breathing difficult. Turn back! 
The third satellite of the fifth planet is our home. Visit it, we beseech you, and report the manner of our going. This vile creature of space has power to draw you to its breast, to crush you as we are crushed. The nomad lurched and shuddered, drawn ever closer to the horrid mass of the thing. A gigantic jellyfish, that's what it was, a hundred miles across. Carr shivered in disgust as it throbbed anew, sending out those grasping streamers of its mysterious material. As the nomad plunged to its doom with increasing speed, Mado tried to locate some spot in the universe where an extreme effect could be attained from the full force of the attracting or repulsive energies. They darted this way and that, but always found themselves closer to the milky billows that now were pulsating in seeming eagerness to engulf the new victim. Once more the telepathic warning. Delay no longer. It is high time you turn back. You must escape to warn our people and yours. Even now the awful creature has us in its vitals, its tentacles reaching through our shattered walls, creeping and twining through the passages of our vessel, crushing floors and walls, its demoniac energies heating our compartments beyond belief. We can hold out no longer. Go! Go quickly! Remember! the third satellite of the fifth planet, to the city of golden domes, tell of our fate, our people will understand, you... The voice was stilled. Mado groaned as if in pain, and Carr saw in that instant that each knob and lever on the control panel glowed with an unearthly brush discharge, not violet as of high-frequency electricity, but red, cherry red, as of heated metal. The emanations of the cosmic monster were at work on the nomad. A glance through the forward port showed that they had but a few miles to go. They'd be in the clutches of the horror in minutes, seconds, at the rate they were traveling. Mado slumped in his seat, his proud head rolling grotesquely on his breast. He slid to the floor, helpless. Carr went mad with fury. It couldn't be. This thing of doom was a creature of his imagination. But no, there it was, looming close in his vision. By God, he'd leave the mark of the nomad on that vicious thing. He remembered the ray with which the vessel was armed. He was in the pilot seat, fingering controls that blistered his hands and cramped his arms with unnameable force. He'd fight the brute. Full energy, head on, that was the way to meet it. Why bother with reversal? It was no use. A blood-red veil obscured his vision. He felt for the release of the ray, pulled the gravity energy control to full power forward. In a daze, groping blindly for support, he waited for the shock of impact. The mass of that monstrosity must be terrific, else why had it such power of attraction for other bodies? Or was it that the thing radiated energies unknown to science? Whatever it was, the thing would know the sting of the nomad's ray. Whatever its nature, animate or inanimate, it was matter. The ray destroyed matter, obliterated it utterly, tore the atoms asunder, whirling their electrons from their orbits with terrific velocity. There'd be some effect, that was certain. No great use, perhaps, but a crater would mark the last resting place of the nomad, a huge crater. Perhaps the misty whiteness would close in over them later, but there'd be less of the creature's bulk to menace other travelers in space. His head ached miserably. His body was shot through and through with cramping agonies. The very blood in his veins was liquid fire, searing his veins and arteries with pulsing awfulness. He staggered from the control cabin, threw himself on his bunk. The covers were electrified and clung to him like tissue to rubbed amber. The wall of the sleeping cabin vibrated with a screeching note. The floors trembled. Madness. That's all it was. He'd awaken in a moment, find himself in his bed at home. He'd dreamed of adventures before now, but never of such as this. It just couldn't happen. A nightmare. Fantasy of an overtired brain, it was. There came a violent wrench that must have torn the hull plates from their bracings. The ship seemed to close in on him and crush him. A terrific concussion flattened him to the bunk. Then all was still. Car Parker's thoughts broke short abruptly. He had slipped into unconsciousness. Chapter 4 Europa 
When Carr opened his eyes, it was to the normal lighting of his own sleeping cabin. The nomad was intact, though an odor of scorched varnish permeated the air. They were unharmed, as yet. He turned on his side and saw that Mado was moving about at the side of his couch. Good old Mado, with a basin of water in his hand and a cloth, he'd been bathing his face, brought him to. He sat up just as Mado turned to apply the cloth anew. "'Good boy, Carr. All right,' smiled the Martian. "'Little dizzy, but I'm okay.' Carr sprang to his feet, where he wobbled uncertainly for a moment. "'But the Nomad?' he asked. Is she... Are we safe? Never safer. What in the name of Saturn did you do? Carr passed his hand across his eyes, trying to remember. The D-ray, he said. I turned it on and dived into the thing with full attraction, then... I forgot. Where is it? The thing, I mean. Look. Mado drew him to the stern compartment. Far behind them there shone a misty wreath, a ring of drifting matter that writhed and twisted as if in mortal agony. Is that it? What's left of it, you shot your way through it. Through and out of its influence. D-Ray must have devitalized the thing as it bored through, killed its energies, for the time at least. Already the thing was closing in. Soon there would be a solid mass as before, but the nomad was saved. How about yourself? asked Carr anxiously. Last time I saw you, you were flat on the floor. Nothing wrong with me now. I'm a bit stiff and sore, that's all. When I came to, I put all the controls in neutral and came looking for you. I was scared. But the thing's all over now, so let's go. Where? Europa. Where's that? Don't you remember? The third satellite of the fifth planet. That's Europa. Third in distance from Jupiter. The fifth planet. It is about the size of Terra's satellite, your moon. We'll find the city of the Golden Domes. Carr's eyes renewed their sparkle. Right, he exclaimed. I forgot the mental message. Poor devils. All over for them now. But we'll carry their message. How far is it? Don't know yet till I determine our position and the position of Jupiter, but it's quite a way. Jupiter's 483 million miles from the sun, you know. We're more than halfway, then. Not necessarily. Perhaps we're on the opposite side of the sun from Jupiter's present position. Then we'd have a real trip. Let's figure it out. Carr was anxious to be off. Luck was with them, as they found, after some observation from the turret. Jupiter lay off their original course, by not more than fifteen degrees. It was but four days' journey. Again they were on their way, and the two men, Martian and Terrestrial, made good use of time in their renewing their old friendship and in the study of astronomy as they had done during the first leg of their journey. Though of widely differing build and nature, the two found a close bond in their similar inclinations. The library of the Nomad was an excellent one. Thrygis had seen to that, all of the voice-vision reels being recorded in Kos, the interplanetary language, with its standardized units of white and measurement. The supplies on board the Nomad were ample. Synthetic foods were there for at least a hundred Martian days. The supply of oxygen and water was inexhaustible, these essential items being produced in automatic retorts, where disassembled electrons from their cosmic ray hydrogen were reassembled in the proper structure to produce atoms of any desired element. Their supply of synthetic food could be replenished in like manner when necessity arose. Thrygis had forgotten nothing. How do you suppose we'll make ourselves understood to the people of Europa? asked Carr, when they had swung around the great orb of Jupiter and were headed toward the satellite. Shouldn't have any trouble, Carr. Believe me, to a people who have progressed to the point of sending mental messages over five hundred miles of space, it'll be a cinch. Understanding our simple mental processes, bet they'll read our every thought. That's right. But the language, proper names and all that, can't get those over with thought waves. No, I'll bet they'll have some way of solving that, too. You wait and see. Carr lighted a cigar and inhaled deeply as he gazed from one of the ports. He'd never felt better in his life. Always had liked Martian tobacco, too. 
Wondered what they'd do when the supply ran out. One thing they couldn't produce synthetically. The disk of the satellite loomed near, and it shone with a warmly inviting light, almost red like the color of Mars it was. Sort of golden, rather. Anyway, he wondered what awaited them there. This was a great life, this roaming in space, unhampered by laws or conventions. The nomad was well named. "'Wonder what they'll think of our yarn,' he said. "'And me, I wonder, too, what that ungodly thing was back there, the thing that is now the grave of some of their people, and what the golden sphere was doing so far from home. It's a mystery.' They had gone over the same ground a hundred times and had not reached a satisfactory conclusion, but perhaps they'd learned more in the city of Golden Domes. "'Another thing,' said Carl, "'that's puzzled me. Why is it that Europa has not yet been discovered before this? That it's inhabited, I mean. Rocket ships couldn't carry enough fuel. Besides, our astronomers have always told us that the outer planets were too cold, too far from the sun.' That is something to think about. Maybe we'll not be able to stand the low temperature, thin atmosphere, low surface gravity. We've our insulated suits and oxygen helmets for the first two objections. The G-rays will hold us down in any gravity. But we'll see mighty soon. We're here. They had entered the atmosphere as they talked, and the nomad was approaching the surface in a long glide with repulsion full on. It was daytime on the side they neared pale daylight but revealing. The great ball that was Jupiter hung low on the horizon, its misty outline faintly visible against the deep green of the sky. The surface over which they skimmed was patchworked with farmlands and crisscrossed by gleaming ribbons. Roadways. It was like the voice-vision records of the ancient days on Mars and Terra before their peoples had taken to the air. Here was a body where a person could get out in the open, next to nature, they crossed a lake of calm green water fringed by golden sands. At its far side a village spread out beneath them and was gone. A village of broad pavements and circular dwellings with flat rooms, each with its square of ground. A golden mountain range loomed in the background, vanished beneath them. More fields and roads. Everywhere there were yellows and reds and the silver sheen of roads, no green save that of the darkening sky and the waters of the streams and ponds. It was a most inviting panorama. Occasionally they passed a vessel of the air, strange, flapping-winged craft that soared and darted like huge birds. Once one of them approached so closely they could see its occupants, seemingly a people similar to the Venusians, small of stature and slender. How in time are we to find the city of golden domes carr ejaculated as if in answer to his question there came a startling command another of the mental messages hail it conveyed to their mind continue not into our country until we have communed with you obediently mado brought up the nose of the nomad and slowed her down to a gradual stop they hovered at an altitude of about four thousand feet, both straining their ears as if listening for actual speech. "'It is well,' continued the message. "'Your thoughts are good. You come from afar, seeking the city of Golden Domes. Proceed now, and a fleet of our vessels will meet you and guide you to our city.' "'Now wouldn't that jar you?' whispered Carr. "'Just try to get away with anything on this world.' Nato laughed as he started the generators of the propelling energy. "'I'd hate to have a wife of Europa,' he commented. "'No sitting up with sick friend story could get by with her.'" End of Chapter 4 Vagabonds of Space Read by Jason Dempsey Highland, New York